It's 12 o'clock. Uh, this is John News today with me, Komla. Adam, the news is coming to you live from digital address GA0992539. Meter reading, customer application that's based on knowledge from our 50th anniversary app and hosted them on the Soft Tribe platform. They were responsible for managing the system updates and database engine. And Ghana Water Company covered every cost of that particular project. Our formal contracts with Soft Tribe started in June 2016. That's the contract they were trying to show, but once you, you said it will affect your cameras. Due to strong leadership and diligence by management and the technical team of GWCL, who worked assiduously to support the project, the project made great strides. Revenue went up by 14%, which is good news for everybody, because that is the bottom line. You can and we won awards. So you had the doctor Clifford Brimer, he is the managing director of a Ghana Water Company, addressing the media on the impasse between the company and software company Soft Tribe. Now, the Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, has released an Afrobarometer on citizens' perception on the country's economic condition. It measures, among other things, living conditions of citizens and management of the economy. Afrobarometer Communications Coordinator for anglo Cone West Africa, Joseph Insani, was in the studio earlier to explain the findings. When we do the trend analysis, you see that consistently it's been an economic, one economic issue or the other. So it's either been unemployment or the management of the economy. And so we know that Ghanaians place a lot of premium mm -hmm. on economic issues. But we also know that, so the survey was conducted between 16 September and 3rd October 2019. And we know that around that time, there were quite a lot of interesting things happening in the economic outlook of Ghana because we know that IMF and the World Bank actually adjudged Ghana as the fastest growing economy. Mm. We also had interesting, we had the de decline of in, in inflation and in invest interest rates, but there were also some lows. We all know about the cleanup of the banking sector that caused like thousands of losses of jobs and there were increases in tariffs, etc. So, well, maybe when we are looking at these findings, we should look at the context at as okay. well. But Afrobarometer goes with the school of thought that the best way to measure poverty is by the experience of the individual. So we have what we call the lived poverty index, which is like an experiential measure okay. of the deprivation of certain basic necessities in the past 12 months. Okay. So the basic necessities that we look at are cash income, food, water, medical care, and cooking fuel. Okay. But when you look at all these, you realize that the highest form of deprivation, like you said, was cash income, where we have like 72% of Ghanaians saying that they went without cash income at least once in the previous year. And it's sort of in line with the issue of unemployment. Because again, looking at the most important priorities, we see that even now that infrastructure is the first, unemployment is still the second. Right. And it's consistently okay. being an issue like for Ghanaians. That. So we use these deprivations to measure what we call the lift poverty index. So we do like an average and then put it on a score of zero to four. So zero means that you had no experience with any deprivation, you weren't deprived. Okay, so that's what lived poverty means. It's like yes, poverty so that you're living in poverty. Yes, so if you okay. experience a high percent, a high level of, of lived deprivation, poverty. then okay. it's high lived, lived poverty, poverty. Okay. then moderate excess. So those in the, with the, in the no lived poverty zone actually didn't experience any, any poverty at all. Of. There are some other interesting um, findings that we shared, and one of them is with the direction of the country. So we asked the respondents if they think the country is going in the right direction or the wrong, wrong direction. direction yeah 2014 mm -hmm. we had just 15 percent of Ghanaians saying the country is going in the right direction eh? between 2014 and 2017 the proportion more than tripled so we had from 15 percent it jumped to 50 percent 
saying that the country was going in the right direction. Now it's falling again to 35 percent. Minor Joy News has been speaking to a cross-section of a public in Accra on the direction of the economy and the impact on their living conditions. Yeah, it's like it's very, very bad. We are all suffering. Just imagine this morning I've bought um, tangerine, eating tangerine, instead of maybe eating proper food or breakfast. But it's like I can't afford any of this thing than to manage the tangerine for that's my breakfast. I can't say good. I'll say bad. Because as an ordinary person there, I'll say I'm suffering. I think it's fairly good. The reason why I'm saying is that um, they are still laying the foundations from the previous government and uh, they are trying to work things out. You know, recently because of the banking crisis, there has been a lot of problems. Formerly you could borrow from a lot of money from these financial companies, but well, now you cannot do that. But if they bring sanity into the system, it will work well for the future, for Ghana. The economy, dear, when you are looking into it, it's not, 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 not. We thought um, things would change after the change. The, I mean, voting, the, uh -huh. but still, we are not seeing top cry. I don't know. I will rate the economy like from five, average. For me, I think... Um, it's it's not it's not all that bad though. I think um, the government is doing a bit well with the free SHS thing. If we give him a lot of time, um, he can do better. For me, the problem I have with politicians as a whole is the st um, promises they give and they cannot deliver. We have bad roads everywhere. Everywhere you go, the roads are bad. Po politicians will come and then they will tell you that, oh, we will fix this for you. After they get the power, you will not see them again. For us, what the only thing we gain is to get um, basic amenities. I mean, our roads are good. We have water. We have electricity as a, um, a citizen. That's the only thing we, we gain. So if we vote for you to come to power, the basic things that we need, I mean, you should be able to provide it for us. It's fairly good. What am I saying? That it depends on where you are. If you are really at the grassroots, you don't really feel it much as compared to maybe those who are working in the government institutions and all that. Whilst with them, anytime there, there's like allowances or anything, they feel it directly. But with, when you are with the private sector, when they want, before they give you allowances or anything like that. That's why I'm saying that it depends on where you are so if you are fitted in a certain part of uh, the economic this thing that's when you feel whether it is good for you or it is bad I would say the economic condition as you speak now it's not good as I am saying it's not good is that the way things are in the, the way the, the way our leaders are inflating things uh, it's not the way that it was when the old government was was in power though I am not going to speak politics here but we, we, we want the people in the country to feel comfortable and relaxed. Nowadays, the way they, they are increasing fuel prices, the way they are increasing uh, electricity tariff, and then the way they are increasing the, uh, our credit, uh, not the, the, uh, the credit that we used to do call, nowadays when you purchase 20 cities, they will do deduction. And then when they do the deduction, they, they, they should let you know that they are deducting this from the amount. At first, when you buy, we know that they were doing the deduction, but it will not reflect on the money that you are purchasing. But nowadays, the way things are going, I will say that it's not good. And then we would like our people who lead in the country to be able to put things in place for we, the citizens, to feel comfortable and relaxed. Thank you. So here are the views of some members of a section of the public on the Afrobarometer uh, perception report and the living conditions of the people and what impact it's having on them. Now, the executive director of the Chamber for Petroleum Consumers, Dan Kanamwa, has appealed to the National Petroleum Authority and other relevant authorities to put in place stringent measures to flash out unscrupulous oil marketing companies who continue to sell substandard fuel to motorists. This follows analysis of fuel samples taking, which revealed the presence of contaminated diesel on the market. You have a lot of challenges with the sort of diesel that we have on the market currently. Uh, if you look in front of me, these three bottles are samples of diesel on the market. Uh, the middle one, which is uh, what the National Standards uh, Committee have approved, this is what you call the 10 ppm, which is currently being uh, imported by BDCs 
uh, if you go to places like Fuel Tree, Chase, and others, this is what they are serving us. This is what the local refineries, because of uh, challenges with their, their plants, are able to produce. This is where we were initially uh, when we advocated for a change to the first one I had indicated. So this is the 1,500 ppm from our local refineries. This is diesel also. And then you will come and find this, which is what they call harbor load which is what is the illegal product that we've been conversing against for the past five years. Boxing all manner of uh, uh, petrochemical uh, products to achieve this. And we would want to believe that uh, effectively immediate any fuel station that will continue to accept some of these products is not only wicked but a criminal organization looking to damage people's engines. We are still calling on the NPA. We are calling on the finance minister who has also waged a war against the illegal operators to move down there now and not wait for next year. This, the three you have here, are diesel products on the market as we speak. And these are samples that have been taken and brought to us. And this clearly will damage anybody's engine after a while. For the very sensitive cars, uh, you can tell immediately. For the less sensitive cars, it will take you a week or two, but you would eventually uh, have to go and work on your engine because of bad harbor load, as they call it. This should be read from the system immediately. How much revenue is lost to Ghanaian consumers? I'm quite certain will be in, 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 in the triples of figures. Because if people are going to have to use this, and the kind of complaints we get on a day-to-day -day basis from people who say, I bought fuel here, and my injectors went off, and my engine is not working. It cannot be said that even a 1,000 pp, 1,500 ppm, which is useful, we've abandoned or are running away from because we want cleaner, only to get a much dirtier product called harbor load. It cannot be allowed to continue. And we are calling on the finance ministry the Ghana Revenue Authority, the security agencies to ensure that the so-called harbor load that today has become so rampant all over the place should be stemmed out. Other than that, we are only endangering road users. Accidents are going to be caused by some of these things because effectively your engine is not functioning as it should and you are endangering not only people's properties or vehicles but human lives also on the roads. The Africa Office of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative is calling for the decriminalization of petty offenses in Ghana, saying most are traced from outmoded colonial influences. The country currently has clear set punishment against first degree felonies and misdemeanors such as stealing food crops, hawking and unlawful motor operations. Head of the Africa Office, Mina Mensa, said such offenses not only target the poor but makes their plight even worse. There's more in the following report. In Ghana's prisons are not just murderers, rapists, armed robbers and other hardened criminals. Within those walls are hungry men and women jailed for stealing cassava, young ones arrested for hawking and other petty offences. Although there is no clear-cut definition for petty offences in Ghana, it is a major contributing factor to the overflowing population in prison cells. The challenge of overcrowding, according to the Ghana Prison Service, exists at a rate of over 48.5% from the previous year. It is for this that the Decriminalizing Poverty, advocating for reform of petty offenses in Ghana campaign, has been launched. The campaign is championed by the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative Africa Office in collaboration with the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, SHRAJ. Head of CHIR Africa Office, Mina Mensa, called for decriminalization of the offenses, arguing wrongly targets the poor and vulnerable in society. If you look at our laws, most of them have colonial antecedents dating back from the British system. The British have taken out of those laws from their books. Why are we keeping them in our books? There's a particular law that I find very funny insulting the national flag. I think that globally it's been realized that a lot of the petty offenses that we have target the poor um, and it's because of the situations of the poor because they are vulnerable and they, because they need to survive 
some of these offenses they commit. For example, somebody goes to a farm and steals plantain or steals um, uh, cassava. And in our criminal books, hawking is a crime. Um, stealing is a crime. Um, Okada business is a crime. Disorderly behavior is a crime. Being drunken is a crime. The effect affects them economically. The person's already poor. You've arrested the person, you've put the person in jail. The person might probably be a breadwinner. And it creates a whole lot of issues. Organizers are proposing non custodial sentencing as punishment for these minor offenses, insisting that they will serve both the nation and poor corporates better. There's many things. One, there's um, you can do community work, non custodial sentencing. Um, in terms of fines, if people are already poor, you give them fines, they might not be able to pay. So what you do is maybe caution them, get them to do community service. We need people to clean up our streets. The CHRI and Shraj hope to gain public support as they continue to crusade for what they describe as unfair punishment for petty offences. PSCA Nanaya Osafos reports for Joy News. Now, the minority in parliament is demanding details in the sale of the Comenda Sugar Factory as it accuses government of deliberately running down the company to reduce its value. Government has announced a strategic investor willing to invest $28 million in the factory commissioned by former President Mahama in 2016. Deputy Ranking Member on the Committee of Trade and Industry, Yusuf Suleimana, said the factory could have been revived long before now. My colleague Kwesi Parker Wilson joins me over the phone from Parliament with more on this. Parker, three years after this particular factory went idle, a strategic investor has been found. That is not satisfactory for the minority? Yes, that is why the minority is quite surprised that government over the years gone by uh, has condemned the factory and made the point that the NDC administration did nothing to sustain the factory. But the minority disagrees. In fact, with this negotiation or perhaps the new takeover, the strategic investor by the Indian firm uh, to take over the operations of the factory. The minority says that there is something wrong somewhere. They have a suspicion that government is colluding or perhaps conniving with individuals to just take over the operations of the, 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 the factory. And this is the reason that when they invited the minister over to the house to brief them on the update of the Commander Sugar factory, the minister was clear in his mind that the factory was worth or the assets worth uh, just about $11 million. Now, and so it's difficult to get a, a partner or a strategic investor to operation. Now, today, they're surprised that out of nowhere, uh, government says there's a new investor and that the person, the company, is willing to invest over $28 million into the operations of the factory. And so they believe that, no, there's something wrong somewhere. And they want government to provide detail, the selection process, how they arrived at the, 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 the new investor or how come the Indian firm won the bid to take over the operations of the Commander Sugar Factory. And they say that the house, the government failed to do that. Well, they should have the processes to ensure that at least they get what they want. And, and Parker, did they say specifically what, what more they want to see in this regard, apart from asking for details of the tender processes and then the companies that bid for this particular contract? Well, so they said that uh, the first thing first, when they get the report, that is when they will know the next line of action. Until then, uh, they, they, they are just monitoring what government will do what is right. And what more has been happening in Parliament, Park, apart from this? Well, well Kamala, um, nothing of interest, actually. Uh, the members of Parliament are, are considering, in fact, it's the consideration stage of the Tree Crop Development Authority. So they are just amending some clauses. And then, of course, I'm sure that when they are done, we'll get some updates and then uh, update our listeners on that. Many thanks to you, my colleague Kwesi Paka Wilson, live there from Parliament with some of the developing stories. Today, away from Parliament, students of the University of Education's College of Technology Education in Kumasi are calling for expedited action on granting autonomy to the institution together with the Mampong College of Agricultural Education. The two institutions have been campuses and later colleges of the main Winneba campus since establishment of a university in 1992. It trains technical and vocational education and training TVET teachers for Ghana and Africa. The Students' Representative Council insists Kumasi and Mampon deserve full-fledged university status. Nana Sensu Mensah has more in this report. 
The leadership cites uneven infrastructural distribution and bureaucracy in the supply of basic education materials from the mother institution as some of the limitations. The students told the press conference in Kumase there is a widespread agitation over delayed processes for granting the two colleges independence from Uniba. Samuel Clinton Boaton is SRC president. If it is projectors you need to facilitate teaching and learning, you need to go and bring them from Uniba. If it is marker board or marker you need, you need to go and bring it from Uniba. So that is that is the nature of the situations we face. So for example, if you have a lecture and there are no marker, markers for you to use, you need you have a lecture that demands that you use computer, laptops, and the computers are not back, are not in from Winneba. How do you learn as, as students? So that is the nature of the problem. Leadership has noted with concern the significant increase in agitation among students over stakeholders' inability to grant Kumase and Mampon campuses of the University of Education, Winneba, autonomy. Management of College of Technology Education, however, says the quest for student for autonomy is laudable. The approach is misplaced. Dr. Philip Otiajan is Vice Dean. Even if we have autonomy, it will still persist. That's the first thing that I will say. Secondly, um, I will not say that when we get autonomy, we will not like it. I'll never stand here and say that. And I said that, I think if you heard me right, I said that even management at Winneba has reiterated on several public platforms that the autonomy is imminent. So why shouldn't I be happy? The, the Vice Chancellor, if you were, uh, you were there, you would have known that he himself said that the autonomy is imminent. And it has to go through a lot of legal processes. So we all be happy for the autonomy, but I think that the legal processes too must be fast track, but it must not be torpedoed. For Joy News, Nana Asensu Mensa, Kumase. You're watching Joy News today with me, Komla. I'm going to take a quick break, we'll return shortly.